Hey, Juliana. Hi, Catherine. Are you excited for season three of K-Pod? I am. We have a great guest, Cheng Ray Lee. But I think before we get into it, there's something that's been on my mind. I know it's been on your mind, which is the spate of anti-Asian violence that's been happening. It seems like almost every other day, there is a new incident of some hominy walking down the street, getting shoved or um, worse, you know, killed just for being Asian. I know it's really upsetting. It's uh, it's angering, it's uh, shocking. Um, and I know that uh, you probably experienced the same thing where I can't watch those videos and not think about my own parents in their place. And it is just so upsetting. You know, this pandemic has been really awful. Uh, and I know that there's been some violence before the pandemic, but since the start of the pandemic, um, hate crimes against the Asian American community are up 1,900%, which is just so galling, especially when you hear, you hear another statistic that says that 90% of attacks on Asian Americans go unreported because the Asian American community are so prone to not want to draw attention to themselves and not report these crimes. And we've got to really change that. Yeah. And I know that you had your own pretty scary incident in January, which maybe wasn't a hate crime per se, but you were the victim of some physical violence um, on the subway just in January. Yeah. So um, I was on the subway on, and it was noon, uh, so it was daylight, and uh, there weren't that many people on the train. And I should preface this by saying that I'm okay. Um, I did sustain a, some injuries, and I was freaked out, uh, but I am uh, recovered and I'm fine. I say that this was not a hate crime because I don't think I was targeted for my race. Um, it was an incident of public lewdness that led to assault and robbery. And uh, this is my first time really getting involved in the criminal justice system in New York. And, uh, you know, it's not my first time being the victim of some sort of crime in New York, but I'd always sort of brushed it off saying, you know, there was no blood shed, uh, there were no weapons, nobody died. And uh, so I would just kind of, you know, get on with it. And uh, maybe I just got lucky with this case, but um, the police were called, I filed a report, and within 30 minutes they had caught the perpetrator. Um, it was pretty unbelievable. It's, I just couldn't him. believe it because yeah. I had, I did not expect them to catch this man. I just thought, what are the chances? And uh, they did catch him and, uh, um, you know, he's been indicted and uh, um, it made me realize that if I had made reports in, uh, you know, the past years when something like this had happened, because things like this have happened previously, that there would be a record, um, maybe a description of this person, if he had done it to somebody else, that even if it didn't save me, because I had already been victimized, that it could save somebody else um, in the future. Because of this, I think it's so important that regardless how serious you think the crime is and that you are okay, maybe it will help people to think of it as in you're doing this to ensure that somebody else doesn't become victimized. Absolutely. I think it's important to share a few organizations that mobilize in this fight against anti-Asian hate crime. A few of them include stopaapihate.org. There's also aafederation.org and hatecrimebook.com. We really encourage everyone to connect with them and take advantage of those resources because we shouldn't be suffering in silence. And actually that's something that a lot of the creatives in the Asian American community have done a great job who were out there on social media calling attention to these crimes and making the case that the mainstream media weren't giving them their due. Absolutely. I would like to thank Daniel Day Kim and Min Jin Lee and Kathy Park Hong and everyone else who's been using their platform to draw attention to such important social justice issues that weren't getting enough attention. 
So Juliana, we should probably get to our first podcast of the season, which is with novelist Chang Ray Lee. Yes, we're so excited. He has a new book out called My Year Abroad. And uh, we were really thrilled that he chose to come on our podcast because he was on our wish list since we started the podcast. Yes, yes. Um, If you tell anyone you're doing a podcast about Korean Americans and arts and culture, the first person they say is, Oh, how about Chang, Chang Rae Lee? Lee? Yes. So so you have a personal connection with Chang Rae Lee, don't you? Um, your fathers went to school together? My dad and his dad both went to Yonsei Medical School, and they both came to New York around the same time. So they knew each other a little bit. He published his first novel, Native Speaker, in 1995. And in my very first magazine job at Vogue, the editors asked me to write a little review of it which I was totally unqualified to do, but I was honored to do. And so I actually met him after I wrote that review. So I've always um, had very fond feelings for Chang Rae Lee because of that first novel and, you know, the connections was I made. Was that your writing first that. writing piece too? It might have been. It might have been um, the first thing I wrote for a magazine. <laughs> Kind of oh, look at that. We come full circle all these years later <laughs> on K-Pod. Yeah, so it was great. It was great to meet him. And also, I have to say, of all our guests, he's the one that my family was most excited about, including my husband, who's not Korean, but is a great reader and is a huge fan of Chang Rae's writing, especially he loved the first chapter of The Surrendered, which is Yeah, I can quite attest to writing. this because this is the only guest that David tried to get in a, in our production meeting to, <laughs> <laughs> to offer up questions. questions. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And of course, then um, my mom, who um, really loves to read and she's very interested in Chang Rae Lee's writing, she was very excited that we were going to interview him. So this is for you, mom. Thank you so much for joining us on K-Pod, Chang Rae. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, we're super excited. Yeah, and congratulations on your book, which Juliana and I both read and could not put down. I, <laughs> I started it, I, I, I got it first, and I kept texting Juliana saying, oh my God, you have to read this. It's getting crazy. You have to read this book. <laughs> have you gotten towards the end yet? <laughs> yeah, so we loved it. So you are often cited as the first big Asian-American writer, and... Uh, um, when Native Speaker was published, it just made such a big splash. And uh, um, this is when you were still in your 20s. And since then, there are so many more Asian voices in literature. And it just so it's just grown. And there's a wide range of Asian authors from different countries and different um, range of experiences. Um, and we wanted to ask you, you must have felt a lot of pressure being the first and uh, um, to represent uh, the Asian community and the Korean community. And uh, um, I wonder if you could talk about what that was like for you and uh, what's changed since then? Well, you know, to, to the truth is, actually, I wasn't the first. I was just the first maybe because of the time in history to be recognized and promoted by the the larger culture. You know, there was, you know, Richard Kim in the 1960s and Ron Young uh, uh, Kim before him and and some other writers who had worked, um, you know, but they were, you know, in isolation. They, the, the larger mainstream culture had, you know, even though they did get some notice, you know, certainly the culture was so different back then, right? And because I'm of a certain age, you know, my parents came in the late 60s after the 1965 Immigration Act, like a lot of first, you know, that wave of Korean immigrants came over. And and so just from virtue of my age and just starting out, I was probably, you know, in that generation, you know, one of the first people to be publishing, you know, and, and um, among some others, you know, so I do have contemporaries, but I didn't feel so much pressure. I just felt a little lonely <laughs> and because, you know, as, as everything, you know, if you're the, if you're the soul or, you know, one of the few who are working and are, and are visible, then, you know, all sorts of 
the people from every quarter are, you know, have certain expectations of you. I, I understand that. But, you know, uh, being a writer, being an artist, you know, you don't get into this work because you're worried about what other people think. <laughs> um, typically, um, it's sort of the last thing. And, and I know that, you know, I, as all writers do, we write from what we see our particular singular experience being, you know, alive as a Korean, as an American. So I tried to, you know, just do my work. I, I always felt as if it would be wonderful to have more voices and uh, comrades, as it were. And, and over the years, it's been great because uh, there are so many other Korean Korean American writers, you know, Don Lee uh, and Susan Choi, more closer to my generation, obviously, people like Min Jin Lee and Aro Kwan and uh, so many others, you know, uh, Paul Yoon, so many other, you know, people maybe a generation younger who are doing such wonderful work. And uh, it just makes me so happy. <laughs> You don't have to be the spokesman anymore. Well, well, I, I, I don't feel like I ever was a spokesperson. You know, other people would would have liked me to be, or other people would have liked me to to do this or that. And and again, you know, that's that's natural. But you know, it's just you, one person can't be a spokesperson. Um, it's impossible, even if they wanted to be. Even if they, you know, because if I said, oh, Koreans should do this and we should think of ourselves this way. And, you know, of course, that that wouldn't apply to anybody but me and maybe a few other people. Did you feel that? I mean, there's such a, a pride from the Korean community, though, to see a Korean person make it out there and, and their name sort of um, in the media. And do you feel like you got a lot of pressure to, uh, from the Korean community at all? There are always certain people who say, oh, you should do this thing, or you should say this, or you should write about these kinds of people, or you shouldn't write about this kind of person, um, you know, because maybe it doesn't reflect so well on Koreans. And um, But that's, you know, again, that comes with the territory. All all writers face that from, from every every direction, but, but that's natural. I would just say to all readers, Korean or, or Korean American or otherwise, is that, you know, writers will write what they write and they're, they're not actually writing for you. <laughs> they're writing, they're writing in the hopes that you'll connect with something, but you know, the truth is never complete. You know, you can't obviously agree with someone's entire worldview life you know, whether it's in real real life or fiction. And that's what one of the things that I'm always asked of by Asian American students and Korean American students, like, how should I be Korean? How, what's my, you know, I want to find out about my identity. And I said, well, I can only tell you about my particular path and my particular experiences, which, of course, you know, maybe 70% of them are similar to yours, but that other 30% is what makes us all different and interesting. You know, and so that's that's how, how I always think about it. So I have to admit that I resisted reading Native Speaker because that's probably the one book that so many people recommended to me when they found out I was Korean. Um, I had a lot of people say, oh, you're Korean. You must have read um, Native Speaker <laughs> or you must you then you must read it. And so I wondered, um, did you you know, ever push back uh, against being labeled a Korean writer or an Asian writer, especially early on? No, I didn't. I, you know, I said, I am Korean American, you know, but but as I always try to say, the label is kind of dull. It, it's very general. You know, it, what what does it really mean? You know, my Korean experience coming here is is even different from my cousin's Korean American experience. And we only lived 20 miles apart, but he lived in Queens in a net full of Koreans, speaking Korean all day. I lived in a white suburb where we were the only Korean family. So how, even though we're from the same blood, the same family, have the same name almost, uh, we have completely different experiences. So, uh, you know, it's... Uh, and again, that's that 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 goes to show you that it's the Korean American label is is the least interesting way to describe any one of us. 
I agree. In my view. But I should say that when your first novel came out, I think that's, I was working at Vogue. I was an assistant. And yeah. they let me write a little review of your first book. I remember. And I, I was remember, so Catherine. excited. Um, <laughs> so I, and I know they probably gave that to me because, I was Korean, but I didn't yes. care because I was just so yeah. honored to be able to do it. And yeah. I really loved your book. And I remember you, um, you had a Korean American publicist too, Miho. And that just happened that to be an accident, really. I mean, you know, she happened to be at Putnam at the time, um, Penguin Putnam. And, you know, maybe they gave her my book, <laughs> um, you, you know, but, but maybe it's because, you know, she wanted to do the book. And, yeah. Um, yeah. It uh, was like an awakening for me because there was your publicist, there was you writing this book. And then I remember going to your book party, which was one of the, maybe the first book party I'd ever been to. And I uh -huh. met two people who turned out, who became some of my best friends, Steve Yang and Kathy Yang. I met them oh, at your yeah. book party. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I, I saw your name. I was like, God, I know a Catherine Hong from Long. <laughs> I Long didn't, I didn't know that was you. Yeah. I didn't know that was you. So great to see you again. But um, this is what, this is why it's so wonderful to have, you know, other Korean American writers working and doing all their different things, you know, writing on all their different ways is because now we have a community. Now we have a context in which we belong and feel comfortable. And not because we know each other so well, not because, you know, we have so much in common. We do have things in common, but, but we are allow each other, as all people who belong in a community do, we give each other room and understanding and we're empathetic rather than seeing people as newcomers, outsiders, uh, you know, interlopers. I guess the point is when people belong, they're not noticed as much. Yeah. You know, whereas before, when I was growing up in the, you know, in the 70s, that's all I felt like okay. I was noticed all the time. And uh, so when I published my first book, yeah, there was a lot of notice only because it was somewhat unusual. Now there's no notice at all, I think. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I know that um, your dad is a psychiatrist and, of course, it's a very small community of Korean doctors who came in the 60s. At one point, my mom said, oh, well, you know his father just a little bit. He's a psychiatrist. And I remember um, your, he was one of the few Korean psychiatrists I'd heard of because, you know, my dad is a radiologist. He, he would not have been able to communicate, any, you know, at the level of a psychiatrist. So I'm curious, was your dad especially adept at English, do you think? He wasn't. I mean, he was okay. Um, you know, he'd studied German in college uh, at Yonsei and so and read a lot in in English and German. And so I think he felt more comfortable as he became became an English speaker. But he certainly was not a comfortable English speaker, especially in the beginning, uh, before he started working every day. Uh but he was, you know, definitely his interest in psychiatry came along because of I think his interest in the literature. He loved he loved to read about the human condition, but he was you know he was adept at language and and he became you know much more so than my mother because she wasn't out in the world working, um, you know he became a, a pretty good English speaker quickly. And do you think that um, growing up as a son of a psychiatrist, it made you more interested in how people think and their internal lives and that kind of thing? Oh sure, sure, yeah. And I think my dad, not that all psychiatrists are like this, but, but I think he was quite empathetic. And I think he was quite, you know, I remember seeing some other Korean dads who were maybe more quote unquote typical, mm -hmm. a little laconic, brusque, you know, stubborn. And I think my dad, I sense this from early on, just like, huh, you know, you should explore this, da, 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 da. you know, and there's not a, it's not an accident that I became interested in literature. And then, and then once I decided, oh, maybe I'm interested in, in writing and becoming a writer, you know, that, that, that wasn't just like some, you know, courage that I had. It was also because I, I probably felt, even though they weren't happy when I became a writer or tried to become a writer, uh, I think I, I felt some, you know, permission from them to, to maybe explore different things. I think you were lucky in that way. 
Mm, very, yeah. very much so. Um, uh, and because I think if they if they had been much more stubborn, it would have been harder for me. And speaking of your parents, so before for today, I asked my parents if they could remember anything about your family because they would know something. And I know they didn't know each other very well, but my mom said Changre's mother was the most beautiful woman. That's the first she said that several times. She kept saying she was just stunningly beautiful, like an angel. <laughs> And then she also said that she was this phenomenally good basketball player and everybody knew yes. she was a star. I thought that was so yeah. cool. Yeah, she was actually a kind of a superstar <laughs> when she was young. <laughs> she was the uh, point guard for the Korean women's national team and also was very beautiful, beautiful enough that she was in Time magazine in 1956. Really? For what? Yes. What? What? What was the story? It was a it was a story about Korea, and they were looking around for people to to model for them. And she was she was she was in Time magazine. Wow! Yeah, also because she was a basketball player and and kind of in the spotlight. And so, yeah, so she was, you know, she, and she was um, she was a very proud person and a very but very kind. And um, I think people really enjoyed being with her and. And I, I remember, and I've talked about this before, how difficult it was for her to come to America where in the early days, particularly where she didn't speak the language, where she felt like she had no control or power. And, um, you know, she, 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 her personality was quite different because of it, you know, uh, just because as any, you know, immigrant would feel without much money, without language skills, without a, any network, you know, <laughs> and that's what I, that's what most uh, people who just, you know, grow up here, especially if they're white, they just have no idea what that feels like. Mm -hmm. But think about it, my mother's background, where in Korea, she was quite well known to a lot of people, not just wow. her friends, you know, <laughs> and then came here and had an entirely different position in society. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to ask you about your New Yorker essay, Coming Home Again, which we found out that there was a movie version that came out last year on it. Yeah, yeah, it just was, I think it's just on uh, streaming, but the, the director, Wayne Wang, uh, mm -hmm. uh, made the film and I helped him a little bit with the script, but, but he pretty much did it. So it's such a um, really moving and personal essay about your mother and um, how you'd come home and you had taken care of her. And um, food plays such an important role in uh, that essay and also um, really important in, in most of your writing. I love the way in that essay you talk about how your mom would ask you what you wanted for dinner every day mm -hmm. and then uh, whatever you wanted she would make for you. We get to witness your family assimilating to American culture because your requests started becoming um, more American as time mm -hmm. went on. And then uh, we get to see this really wonderful relationship. Uh, well, the person... Uh, um, Mrs. Churchill enter your lives. And uh, I thought that was, uh, I mean, I have a, a, a Mrs. Churchill kind of uh, neighbor who came into our lives as well. She was a Mrs. Um, Carlston. She was the first person who made us chocolate chip cookies. Um, mm -hmm. I think she wanted to, to introduce the the kids to this American tradition. And uh, um, it really made me remember reading about Mrs. Churchill that um, Mr. and Mrs. Carson were probably the only non-Korean people who ever entered my parents' home while mm. we lived in uh, Far Hills. And that for your mom to bring Mrs. Churchill in and that with her limited English that they had those... Um, relationship cooking and uh, um, how much it must have meant for your mom to try to make these dishes. I'm not sure if uh, non-immigrant families can really understand just how intimate that is and just how personal that it must have been to have Mrs. Churchill in your home. Oh, yeah, I, I think exactly right. I, I, she probably was the only non-Korean who ever came into that apartment. You know, in, in ensuing years, when my mother felt more comfortable in the culture, that changed. But especially in those first years, our little apartment in New Rochelle, New York, I remember she had a whole list of recipes from Mrs. Churchill and from other people and also from magazines and 
she um, subscribed to like a recipe of the month or recipe of the week. They would send you like a little index card with a picture and the, and instructions. And she had a whole card catalog of those things. And we would kind of go through them every night. You know, well, do we want beef bourguignon or do we want, you know, very, very kind of, uh, you know, Western dishes, you know, um, you know, bananas foster, I remember we made and and thought just blew our minds when we first made that although we almost like burned ourselves with the flambe <laughs> uh, uh, but my mother was game for all that you know I, she was you know I don't want to make it sound like she was so scared all the time she wasn't you know it's just just when she had to maybe certain situations as I write about in that essay like going to the bank or talking to a butcher or something like that but but in her you know in her social life that began to began to grow and 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 become stronger she you know she was she was all in about you know we weren't going back to korea there was no there was no talk of that ever really and and so she was like this is our life and so she you know and and, and she as as my as all immigrants parents find their children start to be you know become different <laughs> you know, they they start to be educated away from, yeah, they get the education that the parents want, but that education actually starts to take them away from everything that they've known. Changri, you went to that famous New York church camp every summer. Did you go? I didn't go, but we were talking to H.J., you know, the founder of Korean American Story. He said, oh, I went to that camp for years. He loved it. He had such fond memories of it. Yes. Now I think, how come I didn't go to that camp? That sounded pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> it, that, it was a great camp, and I have so many friends still from that camp. It's amazing. Uh, some of my closest friends. Uh, Did they make you pray a lot? All the time, and I didn't like the religion, you know, because it was church camp. Yeah. And that was part of the deal. You had Bible study and praying, and I didn't love that part. Because you know, we weren't really a religious family. We went to church, but more socially. But that camp was great because, and I'm and I'm considering writing a novel about it. I uh, heard that. I can't yeah, wait. Yeah, yeah, because it was an interesting time. You know, again, some of us were from the city, and so had more contact with other Koreans. But most of us didn't. You know, most of us were living in some town or suburb, Connecticut, Long Island, New Jersey, New York, and. And we didn't really have that kind of, aside from the Sunday church, you know, time to really spend with with other kids who are Korean. And so it was my two weeks a year where even my American friends back home, they're like, oh, yeah, you're going to Korean, you're two two Korea weeks, (laughs) which I just cherished and I looked forward to so much. Were the counselors college students or who, were they just parents? Yeah, they, they were college students, but they were all, of course, white. You know, oh, they were? They were? There was one or there, there I think late, in later years, there was maybe one or two Koreans. Right, because there are no How does college that work? <laughs> Koreans. But I was, I'm surprised that there were white. I yeah. imagine there were just like aunts and uncles this camp. Oh, like no, 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 because this camp, we, I, I think the Korean churches just rented the camp for two weeks. It was a, an ongoing nor- camp oh. for different, for different groups. You know, I think it okay. was a Presbyterian camp that different church groups would then, you know, it wasn't very big. So, oh, that's so, so they interesting. Had, yeah, so the yeah, counselors so they are had, white. Here come the Koreans, and next week it's the Italians or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> next, next week the German or the, Ger- the next right. week this group from this, you know, probably it was more geographic for the uh-huh. other groups if they weren't ethnic, right? But, um, yeah, and so we, and, and that was the also the great part of an interesting part about it because, and, and this is what I was thinking about writing is that, you know, our heroes were these, some of these counselors who were white guys who were just so wonderful and they were into us and we were into them. And, and what a strange that is kind of thing. Funny. Right? Yeah. Oh, I, I <laughs> picture it totally different now. Yeah. You know, Juliana and I, we actually met at Exeter Summer School. Our parents made us go there in high school <laughs> and we became friends that summer and then we didn't see each other for years and then we started doing this podcast together but uh, we lived in those Exeter dorms for one summer which I'm sure is very different from your experience and I'm always interested in what it's like to go to those bastions of waspiness 
or that must have been mm-hmm. really mind blowing for you. It was because this was early. I went. I landed at Exeter nineteen fall of nineteen eighty, and at that time there were probably you know just a handful of Asian students. Now, of course, Exeter yeah. is probably a third Asian mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. of some yeah. kind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And, but then, uh, it were, it was, and that, but that was, that didn't seem odd to me because I, that's what I expected. Culturally, it was a shock. And because, you know, suddenly I met kids from, you know, Upper East Side of Manhattan, you know, who had gone to the collegiate and, yeah. you know, the St. Bernard, so all those schools and, and who were just supposed to be at Exeter. You know, mm-hmm. so many of the kids were legacy kids. And and so they, you know, it was just part of their normal, you know, educational experience and, and life experience. For me, it was, you know, my parents wanted me to go, I mean, frankly, just because they thought I could get into an Ivy League school because I went there. Right. They were they weren't thinking beyond that. Mm-hmm. What the, and 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 what they got was, yeah, I did end up going to Yale. But what they ended up getting, which is unexpected, of course, is that I was educated in a way that I wouldn't have been educated okay. had I stayed at my local high school. You know, totally, you know, got into uh, writing and literature and and because Exeter was a great place. It was very academically difficult, uh, but it was a place, and I felt this right from the beginning, that really that really upheld artists and writers, which is strange, you know, it kind of an old, old school way, you know, that, you know, where it was, it was a very cultured institution. And, and so they didn't trot out business people to us. They, they always had writers, artists, and talked about, you know, what the whole point of everything was, which was for the betterment and for the glory of, you know, of mankind, <laughs> you know, uh, even though, of course, you know, it's a very waspy place and and it, it was probably full of money and the kids were probably a lot richer than I even could imagine. But but I was lucky because I never felt and maybe other schools were more like this, but maybe because Exeter was quite hard academically. I never felt like I, I was conscious of people's wealth. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. No, I never did. I, I just I didn't. I didn't know who was rich, who was not rich, huh. because we were all kind of in that old school way, just focused on doing well, being smart. Um, you know, it was kind of wonderful that way. I'm sure it's changed. Yeah. I mean, think of how your life is so different now, probably because you went there. You had a very different adolescence than if you oh, went to local suburban uh, totally. You know, m- for this new novel, My Year Abroad, I I dedicated to my teachers. And that's teachers across the board. But I, I must say those teachers that I had at Exeter were were absolutely significant to, you know, how I became you know interested in certain things and how I, how I formed myself. I know that you always talk about how... Um that one year you spent as an analyst as a bank always comes up to haunt you. Um, but it sounds like that was a promise that you made to give it a go um, uh, for your parents. Um, and that almost like that was a year you gave and then it freed you up to do other things. Well, also to myself, you know, because I didn't want to, I didn't have any actual other plan. I thought, well, it might as well get a job. And if it's a good job, even better and fulfill my parents' expectations, but also, you know, because, listen, I, we all grew up wanting to, to please our parents and to, to make them think that all their hard work and all their suffering and all their <laughs> anxiety was, would, 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 yeah, sacrifices would end up with something that they wanted. And, you know, I, I love my parents and like anybody else, I didn't want to make them unhappy, you know, and so it wasn't that big a it wasn't that big a leap for me to do that. It's just that once I was there, and if I think I think if I'd really really enjoyed it, and and really got into the work, I probably would have just stayed. You know, maybe I would have start still written on the side, but 
But, you know, the truth was I, I really didn't enjoy it that much. It was okay, but I could see that it wasn't, a, it wasn't something I was passionate about. And, and I thought to myself at that time, you know, I do want to try this writing thing. I do want to give it a, a go in a serious way. And I'm young enough. I'm only 22. Maybe I'll give myself four or five years and see how it goes. And if I can't do it, I can always make money. You know, I can always go back. I go business school, law school. I can do something. But I can't. I'm not going to wait till I'm 50 after having made enough money. Because I always saw, heard that from people. And they never, of course, do it. Yeah. Because it's too late then. You have a family. You have a whole career. And you're different. <laughs> you know, you're different. Uh, uh, now, I'm not saying it's impossible. It's just it rarely happens. Um, so after your year, um, I, you were a food writer for the New York Press? Yeah, just, just uh, you know, doing little articles here and there. Were there other jobs that you took where you were um, seeking? Uh, not writing, just, just to make money. Mm -hmm. You know, I was the um, assistant to the dean at FIT at the Fashion Institute of Technology. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I did that. And that was a temp job I did every day. Uh, you know, I just did odd jobs and, and ran through my savings from, you know, and then my parents helped me for a little while before I, you know, went back home to take care of my mother. And then, then eventually I just went to graduate school, you know, to do an MFA in creative writing, uh, where I got a small fellowship. So I just cobbled together an existence, you know, through both, you know, support from my parents and doing work and, um, and then once I got to graduate school, that, you know, was pretty much self-sufficient after that. Would you say um, your mom's passing affected your decision to become a writer, gave you more courage to do it? Or was that, relate was that related? I think it was. I think having that whole experience was of taking care of, you know, her, being with her. And, you know, she also knew that I was trying to write and that, you know, she never lived to see anything that I wrote. Or any, you know, when she died, I, I hadn't even gone to graduate school yet. I hadn't published a thing. But she was very supportive of it. And she saw that I cared about it. And I think that helped me, you know, if I had any courage, I think that's what helped me. I knew that she would, she was supportive. And, and that was something that she would have liked to have seen. And my father was that way too, became that way. Obviously, they, he was worried about bigger things at that point. Right. <laughs> right. He was just, you know, devastated by what was happening. And, 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 and also that's the, that also contributed, I think. I think after my mom died, we realized, you know, we did, we did all the right things as a family. You know, my sister and I did well in school. My dad did well in his job. My mother made a life for us at home. And we were all ready just to live the American dream. And of course, after, when she got sick and died, we thought, well, oh boy, well, we didn't think about this happening. Well, the, what the hell was the point of it all? And it kind of destroyed that idea. And, and maybe in the destruction of that idea came a new idea, which is, boy, maybe I should do what I want, really want it, or at least try to do what I yeah. want. Yeah. I think... Um because that was such a tragic and abnormal event, you know, that your mom would die so young that um, maybe the usual considerations of, oh, what will the other relatives think that Chang Rei want to be or all those things, nobody cares about anymore. It's no, it gives no, you kind no. of a reset. Yeah, it gave me a perspective that I think as a normal 24 year old, I would not have had, you know, I still probably would have been full of uh, you know, the other people's expectations mm -hmm. full of, you know, Koreans, you know, as we all know, can be kind of focused on status and, and, you know, where you went to school, what kind of job you have, all that stuff. And, and yeah, I think that experience wiped that all away for us. You know, I, I sometimes think about that, you know, without that experience, what would have happened? Would I have given up writing sooner? Would, would my parents have been more forceful and they're saying, hey, why don't you just stay and mm -hmm. work at Wall Street? <laughs> and maybe I would have, you know, acceded to that. OK, so I have a big question, which actually my mom would be happy I get to ask you because she's fascinated by um, the fact that you've said in the past that 
somehow you still don't feel quite like a native speaker because English was not your first language and you're still have this feeling sometimes that syntax and grammar don't come naturally to you, which I find crazy because you came here when you were so young and you're one of the greatest writers in America, but you have this feeling that something is a little off kilter maybe. And I'm trying mm. to, I just, I would love to hear a little bit more about that. You know, my wife who's not Korean sometimes notes that, you know, just in my speech, sometimes I'll reverse things <laughs> you know? for no reason. You know, and and sometimes with gender, I'll just say, you know, there's some there are things that I because I learned the language at the age of about five or six. And this is what my mother always told me. And my parents told me is I was a really good Korean speaker. I was an advanced little kid in terms of how I spoke Korean. So I think language was something that came to me you know, that I felt very comfortable in. And and so the making the switch to English, I think was both easy, but also kind of tortured because I wanted to speak it so well. And I, you know, and, and, you know, when you come to a language like that, a- after having one already, it's something that you're sort of conscious of all the time. And maybe that's the difference between me and someone else me and another writer, whereas I'm very conscious about my language Mm -hmm. in a way. And and because, you know, when I'm writing it, I can go over it and go over it and go over it again and again. And so that's okay. Uh, And maybe that's that's how my style comes about. But in my daily life, of course, I don't feel like I'm comfortable speaking English, but there are just some little, you know, foggy parts that come up. For no reason, <laughs> and and way you know the, the way that fluent speakers do, but if it's not their native language, and I guess English really isn't my native language in a funny way. Even though I don't speak Korean very well, I understand it. Okay, how, how is it? You're so. How would you describe your Korean now? Oh, it's like you know, it's still my six-year-old, maybe clever six-year-old boy's Korean, and I wish I could speak better Korean. I just haven't had the opportunity to, or the time to really do that. And of course, if I lived in Korea, I think it would become better quickly, but, but, you know, then it's more vocabulary and again, grammar, all those things that yeah. I never had to really learn. Yeah. Speaking of language, one of the um, aspects of your book that I so enjoyed were the names of the restaurants and uh, the wordplay <laughs> that you came up with. And they were so delightful. I can. I almost pictured you sitting there coming up with these um, <laughs> clever names, like uh, the frozen yogurt shop is WTF Yo exclamation yeah. point. Um, yeah. You have a fancy hot dog uh, shop called You Dirty Dog. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we love so, Elixirant. That's such a yeah, great name. Which is a mashup <laughs> of Elixir and yeah. Excellent. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you must have had a lot of fun coming up with these names. I did, you know, it, it, and I, they, they came to me kind of quickly for some reason. I, and maybe that's just the way I think, you know, I'm always making jokes, you know, and, and having fun with language. And so that part, that part's easy. The, you know, the other part about, you know, character and, and more, more profound stuff that, that's going on, that's, of course, really tough. But, uh, but, but all the, and one of the things I enjoyed about this book was because of the, who the narrator is and his youth, but also kind of his old soul, I could kind of do a whole range of language and a whole range of kind of expression and, you know, everything from pop cultural stuff to social media stuff to how kids talk to also more, you know, kind of intellectual academic stuff. and. Yeah, so it, it was it was fun that way. Well, I've noticed that um, the characters in your books, um, there's always a character that is around the same age range as your daughters are around the time mm. of your writing. So yeah. in Surrender, June is around 11 when your daughter's around yeah. around that yeah. age. And then Fan is 16 when yeah. your daughter's around that age. And now your daughters are in their 20s or so and Tiller is mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. So do you use them as sort of a sounding board or is, there, is that a, a device to maybe sort of connect with them or do you find inspiration from them? 
well, it was more a sounding board for Tiller because, you know, I've been around their language and around their, you know, their kind of chatter. Also my college students, you know, they were all that age. And, but, but more to the point, I think you're right. I think, and maybe this is unconscious actually, it's more, you know, they're such a big part of my life. And, and I'm always so, as all parents are, you know, concerned and thinking about them. And, and whenever I have a character in that situation, I always, I can't help but think, well, gosh, what if my daughter were in that situation? She's the same age. How would she do go about things? And I'd be so afraid for her. And I do. And it's a way to kind of, and I think, emotionally connect with that character. It's not so much to connect with my daughters. I have connections with them, but to connect with my daughter and that character in a way that that is real to me so I can write it in the most real way. Speaking of your daughters, Juliana and I both have teenage children who are half Korean, and I know your mm. daughters are half Korean. Can you tell us a little bit about how, um, how have you brought Korean culture into their lives at all? Or, and now that I guess your parents are not around, it's really mm -hmm. you. It is me. And, and I haven't, you know, when my father was alive, you know, they would enjoy getting together with him and he'd speak Korean to them or no, as much as he could, you know, not much, but for them to understand. But, um, I think it was just more through food, actually, just cooking certain foods and talking about them and saying, this is how my mother made it. And, you know, giving them a sense of that. So it wasn't just a dish. Right? Yeah, and I then, think uh, for my kids, too, Korea, Korea, they feel the most Korean in just in food, in terms of food. Yeah, yeah. right. You know, as they've gotten older, um, they have more ideas about it. They start making it themselves. Like my, my younger daughter just made dakbukki for us and my older daughter is, you know, making all this other stuff. And, and now also because of, you know, all the shows, they, they start watching the shows. And my younger daughter is really into BTS, <laughs> kind of late for her. <laughs> she's 20 years old mm -hmm. and she's thought, oh God, I'm finally getting into that. And so, and now she's actually thinking, spending a semester abroad mm -hmm. at Yonsei next year. Oh so, my God. So, it's so and, and that's, I think, just naturally happening. I haven't really pushed any of that. And, you know, they, I haven't sent them to Korean school or anything like that. But, but they just naturally have gravi gravitated towards it. A, because the foods are so delicious. <laughs> <laughs> but also because they realize, oh, you know, I'm I am different from everybody else around here. You know, I I'm I'm not just this. I'm this and this and this. And so they're, you know, just as naturally that they, they do. They're exploring it, which makes me very happy. So you have spent time teaching in Korea as well. Mm -hmm. At Yonsei, I enjoyed teaching in Korea. You know, I teach in English in the particular. I taught at Yonsei in their international school and. So, you know, as an English language based um, curriculum, the kids, though, were mostly all Korean, but Korean diaspora from everywhere. You know, Australian Koreans, Korean Americans, some Korean Koreans who are just interested in in having an English language academic experience. And so it was really cool. You know, it was really, really cool that way. So how do um, the Korean Koreans um view you, you know, you as a writer? I think when I go over there, you know, it's very welcoming. And, and you know, I think they're, they always express pride in, you know, things I've done. And, and they always, you know, wish me well. So I, th I think they, I think they pretty much recognize who I am in, in terms of, you know, I'm not going to be a Korean Korean writer. I can't do that. They know that. And, but, um, but, but because of my work, you know, and some of the themes in my work, uh, it, it, you know, there's, and this is probably something that Koreans, Korean Koreans are recognizing too, that, you know, the world is a big place and, and you know, there, there are different forms of being Korean. <laughs> you know, I, I think when we went back to Korea when in the 1980s, when, when we were younger, people were like, no, no, this is the way to be Korean. We're Korean. This is the home thing. But, but the world has, you know, the, as Korea has gone outside, the world has seeped into Korea too. And, 
And so I think you'll just see Korea becoming an increasingly, you know, multinational, you know, transnational, interesting place. I think we have one last question, which is, are there any Korean habits that you feel like um, you've picked up maybe now in life and that you think, wow, I can't believe I'm doing this? Yeah, well, no, I definitely feel as if uh, there are a lot of things that my mother did that I'm doing. You know, I remember I, I and my wife jokes about this all the time. I love going to the grocery store and especially during the pandemic, which is really the only thing you could do. You know, mm-hmm. for, to get out into the world, and she'd be nervous about that, but I didn't care. And so, my mother, I would always go shopping with my mother, and she would always have her coupons. And and I, you know, I just love just going through every department and picking out stuff, and and I still do that. And I I try, you know, I go biking here. I try to go biking every day in San Francisco because the weather's pretty nice and. And uh, I'll stop, I have a, a little basket and I'll stop and do the day's groceries, uh, sometimes too much for the basket, but but I'll stop every day and I'll do that. And I don't clip coupons anymore, but yeah, I used to when I was poorer, but sometimes if I see a coupon, I'll, I'll, I'll clip it and put it in my wallet in the hopes that I'll use it. <laughs> and, so, and I think about my mother and uh, uh, so, yeah, that's one of the things that I, that I kind of see how she, you know, looking for good deals and trying to find a good product and, you know, getting into all that. I mean, you know, again, you save ends up, you save like 20 cents, but the feeling is, <laughs> the feeling is great, you know? <laughs> so. Oh yeah. <laughs> Thank you to Cheng Rei Li for being our guest on K-Pod. Cheng Rei Li's latest book is My Year Abroad, and you could get it where all books are sold. If possible, please support independent bookstores. Please follow K-Pod on Instagram at kpodpod. You can follow me at juliana underscore sone, and Catherine is at Catherine Hong 100 Thanks for listening.